Hello, everybody. Okay, just a second. Hello, everybody. Good to see you again. Uh, sorry for the little delay in the start. Actually, I just want to double check one thing. Do we have an audio connection? If we're good in the Carnegie Mellon University classroom, please wave your hand. That, that'll be good enough for me to know that we have a connection. If you, yeah, okay, good. Great. It looks like Zoom has changed their style a little bit. It appears that in Zoom now it's only possible for me to see people if I also turn on my camera. I guess that helps to make everything symmetric. Is that how this works? I'm actually not sure. Oh, no. Now it's okay. All right. So I'll be honest. I actually don't quite understand how Zoom works. I, I understand how YouTube works instead, so we'll use this. Um, but it's great to see everyone again. Uh, sorry for the delay. Actually, one reason for the delay is some of you know I've actually been working on trying to do something to stop uh, coronavirus, and we're getting very close to pushing this out. So I was actually just quickly having a conversation with somebody to get it done. But now uh, let's, let's talk about what we're going to do in the next section of extremal combinatorics. We have finished the Semiradi regularity lemma, which is one of the big, uh, big gems in, in the middle part of the class. For the final part of the class, I want to talk about something that has to do with sets. And some of these things will look a little bit familiar if you, if you have taken a class in probabilistic combinatorics, which is uh, one of the graduate classes here at CMU, or maybe if you have taken one of these classes that John Mackey has taught, who knows, maybe he also mentioned this thing there. But I want to talk about this just for completeness. And so the beginning of this, uh, of, of this topic, one second, let me save this first so that we won't lose anything, right? The beginning of this topic is, <clears throat> it's, it's a problem about adding up real numbers. So this is a question that Littlewood and Offord were curious about. This is a question of Littlewood and Offord. And the question was, if you have a bunch of numbers, a bunch of real numbers, we'll do real numbers, they were actually interested also in complex numbers. But the question was, given n real numbers, each of which is, you know, bounded away from zero. So let's just say each with absolute value bigger equal one. Okay, so each of these is with absolute value bigger or equal 1. Uh, the question is, what can you say about the probability that if I take a random sum of them with plus or minus signs, given this, can you prove that a random sum of them with plus or minus signs in front of each has some probability of being zero. So let's say has probability has some has I'll, I'll say has some probability. We want to bound the probability. Has probability of being zero uh, well, we can ask about, if we want to know something about the probability, we could ask, can we show that it has probability of being zero, hmm, which is, let's just say, less than or equal to, uh, less than or equal to something? I'm writing down actually something that's quite, uh, that, that's, that's relatively simple. Um, just a second. Probability of being zero, which is, oh, oh, oh just a second, just a second. I want the other way first. I wanted the other way first because that was easier. Okay, let's, let's try to write the other way first. So I, I'm trying to say, um, this, is a, this is a question, which is say, suppose you're interested in a situation where you have a bunch of real numbers, all of them happen to have absolute value bigger or equal one, that just forces them to be somewhat apart. Although the one is not important, I could make them all like bigger or equal 10 or something. I'd like to know, can I prove that if I take a random sum of them using plus minus signs in front, uh, the probability of being zero is at least something. I want to put the, the best possible bound here. And just to put an example, let's do some example. You know, suppose I have some real numbers. If I happen to know that the numbers are like uh, 2, 1, minus 1, right? There is a way to make the sum equal to 0. This could make a sum equal to 0 by, you could do something like 2, and then, so it's plus the 2, and then minus 
the 1, and then I guess plus the negative 1. That's equal to 0. So I'm just emphasizing that each of these signs that I put in front, I'm going to choose at random. Okay, so the, 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 the phrasing of this is, I'd like to be able to prove a general statement. Given n numbers, each of them has absolute value bigger or equal to 1, I'd like to put a number here so that the probability that if I take a random sum where there are 2 to the power n possibilities, possible plus and minus combos, all equally likely, I want to know, could I, could I ever prove a statement that says for any n numbers, each of them absolute value bigger or equal to 1, it is always true that a random sum of them uh, has probability being 0 bigger or equal to something. And the answer is, uh, this particular one that I put, the answer is not interesting. What's the best lower bound you can write here? I'm just going to write some brackets around here to emphasize where my parentheses are in my sentence. So, has I want to say the probability being 0 is bigger or equal to something. Yes, I see, I see. Uh, Faye is saying 0. The best bound you could write here is not interesting at all. This is the best bound you can write, and it's trivial to prove, because every probability is at least 0. So I'm done. This is not the interesting question, right? Because first of all, to prove bigger or equal to 0, I don't have to do anything. It's always going to be bigger or equal to 0. And on the other hand, I can't hope for any better because the condition that's been given is just that I have n numbers for which they all have absolute value bigger or equal to 1. What if my numbers were like pi and square root 2 and like just ridiculous numbers that will never be able to combine to 0 anyway? Then the answer is 0. So the actual question that Littlewood and Offord were interested in is not this. They were interested in the other direction. So I'm going to get rid of this, and that was what I wrote the first time. And then I wanted to stop and talk about why it is so interesting to ask the less than or equal question. Okay? So the point here is that somehow, whenever you're doing math, you want to know why is the question that we're asking the way it is. And so we don't ask the bigger equal question because the answer is all you can prove is bigger equals zero and you can't do any better. But less than or equal to is a different story. So what could we do here? This gets interesting. So it turns out that they were interested. I'll, I'll tell you why they were interested in this, by the way. This has some relationship to what's called, um, it's almost like something called concentration inequalities. In fact, if you're flipping a coin many, many times, the chance that you will have the number of heads equals to the number of tails. Actually, does anyone know what that is? That's, that's somewhat relevant to what we're about to do. So this is the question we're about to play with. Heads and tails, by the way, is like a version of this where the numbers are all ones. Does that make sense? If I have all of the numbers and they're all ones, then in fact the random sum of plus and minuses is actually the number of heads minus the number of tails. So there's some relationship there. Actually, let's, let's go and play with that. So here's a question. Does anyone know the probability that if you flip, let's call n an even number. So I'm going to em emphasize this is an even number, otherwise the answer is not interesting. Uh, n times for a coin what is the probability that the number of heads is equal to the number of tails? Does anyone know about what this is? Let's write some approximations. Feel free to raise your hand. Feel free to uh, press the yellow thing, and I'll, I'll be very happy to call. Actually, I'm also going to do one thing to the stream. Something tells me that this stream is on normal, laten lo normal low latency, not like ultra low latency. So in fact, I'm going to restart the YouTube stream, if that's OK. And I'm going to restart it on the settings of ultra low latency so that we can uh, definitely have the back and forth. So you'll see the YouTube stream drop off, and we'll come right back. Okay. So let me just do this.